Um, so th I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, I know that people will be coming in over time. Um, you are in the right place if you think you're coming to a session on culture and community in the time of transformation. Um, and this is also part of the um, quarterly program from the National Park Service Partners, the AHA program, and the New Bedford Creative Seaport Cultural District. My name is Lee Heald and I am the director of the AHA program and so I'm one of your hosts and delighted to welcome you. Um, we kind of get together on a quarterly basis to talk about things that concern us and today we were really trying to um, take advantage of all of the great research that's being done and really amplify the themes that we share together and really work on things that we can do to um, improve our um, ways that we talk about the voices in our community to really think about collaboration, cooperation, and just sharing our knowledge. I just wanna say from the AHA point of view, um, this is not really gonna talk about programs that we do on the ground. And so we're gonna set up another meeting on Wednesday, May 11th at noon to really think about what we're doing in downtown New Bedford and the, the wider community for the summer programming. So please put that on your calendar. It's another Wednesday at noon meeting. Um, and I just wanna give a shout out to all of the people who are really doing programming and really creating a fabric of downtown um, and the, the whole community to really think about how we re-energize and re-emerge and really reconnect after what we've been going through for the last couple of years. This is the arts and culture component, but we really are part of a fabric of, of the whole community, really thinking about ways that people um, visit to eat, um, ways that people shop and ways that kind of people connect with each other in open spaces. So um, please think about um, opportunities to kind of help the whole community out and be our connective fabric as we move forward. Um, I'm gonna turn this over to Lindsay Compton from the National Park Service, who's gonna say a few words about the, the artist programs and um, what the National Park Service is up to. So Lindsay, over to you. Thanks, Lee. Hi, everyone. I'm Lindsay Compton. I'm the Arts and Youth Coordinator at New Bedford Whaling National Historical Park. I put my email in the chat if you need to reach me for any reason. Um, first, I wanted to share that we have a very amazing list of upcoming programs for the next couple of months. And thanks to Eric from your theater for um, giving me that reminder that we should be doing that list. I think we skipped it last quarter. So happy to have that list back again. Um, if there's any programming that you would like to add to the list, please direct message me through the chat. I'll add it. And then when the meeting is over, I'll share the Word document with everyone um, who got the invitation to this meeting. Um, one more thing I wanted to share just really quickly, um, and I actually have a great article to share with you all. Um, the South, South Coast Today uh, Standard Times did a really great article on a press release that we um, put out last month about our uh, yearly artists in residence. So currently we have Isabel Matia, who is an artist in residence through the end of March, and actually tomorrow night will be um, her program, Tomorrow's AHA. She'll be giving an artist talk, as well as talking about how gender has influenced her work. And she'll also be asking for what we're calling a call for objects. She's creating a small museum of sentimental objects from folks from the New Bedford and South Coast area. So if you have a sentimental object that you'd like to see included in that project, please show up with your object tomorrow night in the makerspace. We would love to hear your story about your, your object. Uh, we have Kate Sheridan coming um, April 1st. They'll start their residency and they'll be in residence from April through June of this year. They are a comic artist based in Louisville, Kentucky, though they have deep connections to New England, both family and friends living in the area. Um, and they're gonna be doing some amazing um, comic. They're a comic artist and illustrator. So they're gonna be giving um, like a youth and an adult 101 comics crash course. Uh, which will be really fun, um, and some other programming about censorship and comics and, and book banning, which is very topical right now. Um, we also have Candida Rose, our amazing uh, local musician. She will be in residence from July through September. So um, look forward to some amazing performances as well as her um, presenting on a lot of the work that she's done um, tying kind of American music to Cape Verdean music and exploring all of the ways in which both have influenced one another. 
And then to kind of round out the end of the year, we have Margot Connolly Mason, uh, who is a South Coast resident who will be doing um, a project kind of surrounding local ecology and she'll be creating a children's book. So we're really, really excited about all of the programming that we have coming up this year through the Artists in Residence program. I encourage you to check out that article to learn more about the four artists and um, let me know if you have any questions. Um, thanks for hearing my spiel and now I'm gonna pass it over to Margot. Thank you so much, Lindsay. So thank you, Lee Hilds, too. So my name is Margot Saulnier, and I'm the creative strategist with New Bedford Creative, and I also manage the Seaport Cultural District. So welcome to everyone for attending today. As Lee said, this is usually the arts and culture partners of New Bedford, but we are very excited to expand our geographic reach for this session. So I'd like to thank all of our New Bedford partners, as well as our friends at Viva Fall River, Fall River Arts and Culture Coalition, one South Coast Chamber and the South Coast Community Foundation for helping us get the word out about this presentation today. And we warmly welcome our friends from the South Shore hailing from the Fuller Craft Museum and the Plymouth Antiquarian Society. So we are here today to hear from the Slover Lynette audience research team who were commissioned by the Barr Foundation to take the national research study called Culture and Community in a Time of Transformation and drill down to offer a Massachusetts based report as well as regional reports. So today is the first regional presentation focusing on the South Coast and South Shore. And it's my pleasure to introduce Sue Ellen Kroll from the Barr Foundation. Thank you, Sue Ellen. Thank you, Margo. Good day, everyone. I'm Sue Ellen Kroll, Senior Program Officer in Arts and Creativity at the Barr Foundation. It's wonderful to be here with you all and to see so many familiar faces and some new friends as well. Uh, thank you for joining us during your lunch break to discuss culture and community in a time of transformation with this focus on the South Coast and the South Shore. Um, it's really nice to be here with you at a time of hope and reconnections and something I'm personally really excited about this Sunday, daylight savings time. <laughs> it feels like we're all coming out of a long hibernation, although for many, including the arts and culture sector, there hasn't been a slowdown, just a long sprint through uncertainty and disruption. And now two years later, we have an arts and culture sector that's resilient, deeply engaged and, re and reflective and grappling with what it means to have racial equity throughout our practices and organizations. As we look forward, there's a lot of big questions. Many of them we've been asking over the past two years, including what are the characteristics and contours of the new normal? What knowledge and information would help arts and culture organizations to rebuild and reimagine their relevance and impact? What could the role of arts and culture be in catalyzing a more just society? When will audiences return to live arts? What do audiences and communities need and want from arts and cultural organizations? The incredible team at Slover Lynette had some of the same questions. And as partners, we've complicated and nuanced our questions. As you can expect, after two years of big societal changes, people's attitudes have changed. We want to support the cultural field to learn what we're hearing from audiences about what they want and need so they can more deeply engage with their communities. This is the focus of the Slover Lynette research that brings us together today. The Barr Foundation really values working with the Slover Lynette team because they're social researchers who are restless in their curiosity, generous in engaging people with multiple lived experiences, and passionate about giving arts leaders the information and insights they need to change and succeed. For over 20 years, the Silver Lynette team has melded empirical rigor with generative techniques that taps the imagination of community. As Margot mentioned, the Silver Lynette team has completed a Massachusetts statewide study released last December. For those of you who haven't seen it, we can definitely share that with you, as well as these nine regional reports. And they've been skillfully guided by a 10 person advisory committee who are representative of the state demographics and the art field. And I'd like to recognize and thank Margot for her service on the advisory committee and for serving as our convener today. Like you all, I look forward to hearing more about what audiences from the South Coast and South Shore hope to see, what they're thinking, and how they want to engage with arts and culture after our collective experiences of the past two years. So I'm now going to hand it over to Jen from Slover Lynette to get us started. Thank you. Thank you so much to this whole team for convening this group together. 
Uh, we are just delighted to be able to really dive in at the regional level for the first time with all of you and talk about what we've learned from the community in the South Shore and South Coast and start to think about what that might mean for activation and action going forward. So I will continue the kind of introductions um, a little bit further as one of the first steps, but just to give you a little bit of a roadmap for how we're hoping to spend our time today, we'll um, finish those introductions out. Um, my colleague Matt and I will be giving you some of those insights into the South Shore and South Coast research findings specifically and kind of relating them to the state as a whole so you can see what's unique and what's kind of similar in terms of this region and the broader statewide context. We have three amazing community speakers to talk about and reflect on the ways that they're already embodying some of the action areas that we're hearing from the community could be most impactful or most exciting for them to see in the arts and culture sector going forward. And then we'd love to break this group up and talk in smaller groups about some of those action areas, think together about what that looks like in your context. We'll be taking notes from all of those sessions and sharing them back with you so you can see what's discussed across the community more widely. And then we'd love to circle back at the very end, share a little bit back out with all of you. And then given that this is the first of nine of these regional convenings, we're really hoping that you'll share your thoughts on how we did today and how we could make this better and iterate on it so that it's more useful, more relevant for other regions across the state going forward. Okay, so jumping into those introductions, my name is Jim Benoit Bryan. I'm the Vice President and Co-Director of Research at Slover Lynette Audience Research. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm joined by my colleague, Matthew. Matt, do you want to say hello? Hi, I'm Matt Jimitopoulos. I'm a researcher at Slover Lynette, and we're working with Jen on this project for a couple of years now in the Massachusetts one since since last spring. My pronouns are he and him. Wonderful. You've already met Margot, but our other speakers today are Brittany and Harvey. Brittany, will you jump on and say hello? Sure. Hi, I'm Brittany and Harvey. I'm the co-founder and co-director of the Fall River Museum of Contemporary Arts. Wonderful. And Peter Linnell Walker. Peter, will you say hi to you? Hello, my name is Peter Lonnell Walker. Um, I'm representing Third Eye in the community space today and just a villager villaging. Great. All right, let's dive in. Um, so to give you a bit of a broad overview of how some of these conversations came about and the broader goals, um, Solon spoke really eloquently to some of the many questions that we have during this time of change. Uh, and, and uncertainty. And at the very highest level, our goal throughout has really been about supporting the evolution of the arts and culture sector towards increased impact and equity. And we've gone about that through investigation of a few different kind of topic areas. So those include how could we be supporting communities as an arts and culture sector during this time? How have people actually been engaging with and connecting to arts and culture online, in person, through personal creative activities in many realms um, over the past few years and prior? We're interested in kind of what the role of digital engagement has been. What's the value of that been like? How have people been using it? And how do they expect to use it in the future? We've, dove, we've been doing a dive into systemic racism and perceptions of systemic racism in different parts of the arts and culture sector. Some questions about the role of social issues and what arts and culture organizations could be doing to address social issues and many of which are already doing to address social issues. And then kind of broadly, how do people hope to see change in the arts and culture sector going forward? There's a lot of really incredible research that's been happening over the last few years during this time. And um, there are a few things that we think distinguishes this study in particular, just to give you a little bit of a sense of, of this work. Um, it's very community centered. So the research we'll be sharing is drawing from a representative sample of the state of Massachusetts, rather than focusing just on cultural attenders, which some other research projects have done. It's pretty large scale. So we have more than 8,000 responses from people across the state of Massachusetts, more than 800 from South Coast and South Shore and 74,000 across the country as a whole. And because we're asking questions at all of these levels, regional, state, national, we have some really interesting comparisons and benchmarks that we can talk about around where different parts of the country are unique um, and where there's real alignment across parts of the country. And then open access has been at the core of this work. We're happy to share our survey instrument in case there's anything you want to use from it or pull from it. We'll share data tables. We'll even share the data set itself if you'd like to do further investigation. It's a very rich resource and we just can't 
fully mine it. Um, and I'm happy to say that there are many academics already working um, on exploring this data set in other directions. This is also part of a research sequence. Um, so we started back in March of 2020, really thinking about how we could help inform arts and cultural organizations, many of whom were coming to us at Silver Lynette and asking lots of critical questions. Um, so that was the first kind of national wave study with a sample of more than 125,000 people. There were a lot of questions raised by that study, in particular among Black and African American respondents. Um, and so we created some qualitative interviews with 50 Black and African Americans across the country to explore those themes in more depth and detail. And there's a report that emerged from that. It also shaped how we asked questions in the Wave 2 National Audience and Community Survey, which was conducted in May, April and May of 2021. Um, and that in the genesis of that second wave, we really were talking to the Barr Foundation about a deeper focus on Massachusetts. And so, as Suella mentioned, there's a statewide report that goes into more depth and more detail than we'll be able to talk about today, as well as these nine regional reports. And we'll share links both to the statewide report and to the South Shore South Coast report with all of you on the call today. And just a show quickly what what we're talking about when we're, we're showing this reporting on south coast and south south shore and sh south coast um here are all of the regions that we broke the state into um based on conversations with our advisors um and so south coast and south shore you see here the uh the data is representative of people who responded to our survey who live in in these areas um in these towns um, so as you see, there were, as Jen said, over 800 responses, um, and that's what that's what we will be kind of reporting out on as we're talking about these groups. So to jump right into it, um, arts engagement in the state of Massachusetts and in the South Coast and South Shore is really great. Um, we saw that um, on the left of these of these charts, the gray bar is showing the whole state of Massachusetts. The red bar is showing respondents from South Coast and South Shore, um, but we see that during the pandemic, nearly everybody was participating in personal creative activities. Almost three quarters of people were participating in arts and culture online, um, and that mirrors um, what people were doing pre-pandemic as well, as far as attending arts and culture in person um, and participating in community-based projects um, or doing participatory arts. Uh, when we asked people about how important arts and culture was to them, um, we saw that South Coast and South Shore was basically right in line with the state as a whole. Um, you know, nearly two thirds of people find it find arts and culture organizations are highly important to them. Uh, we asked people about how they thought that arts and culture organizations could be helping out their community. Um, and we found that there were three kind of main ways that help can come from. Number one is providing an emotional outlet, um, you know, just giving people an opportunity to relax or find moments of beauty and joy, um, but also to express themselves. Um, the second was for opportunities for connection and learning. Uh, and then finally for practical things like, you know, giving them information about COVID-19, helping them deal with financial and economic uh, issues. Um, and we also asked about how important co-creation and collaboration was between arts organizations and people's communities. Um, so nearly 75% of, of South Coast and South Shore residents want arts and cultural organizations collaborating with their communities um, on program creation. Um, and you can see here, the other regions of the state are listed out. South Coast and South Shore is among the highest of, of those who found importance in these uh, these opportunities for co-creation. So shifting over to digital engagement, and please feel free to pepper us with questions in the chat if anything occurs to you as we walk through these slides. Um, we wanted to learn about digital engagement at a number of levels. So you can see we start at the top level here with awareness of online arts and culture. Did they know that there was an offering available? And there's very high awareness both for the state as a whole and for this region. Participation is a little bit lower, but still quite high as Matt mentioned with almost three quarters of people at the state level and within the South Coast and South Shore regions having participated in at least one online arts or culture activity. 
over the last year. Um, and I'm sure this won't be shocking to you. There's a pretty big dip that happens when we move to the proportion we've actually paid for any online arts or culture activity. So it's a little over a quarter of individuals who have paid for any kind of online arts or culture activity. And we do have a little bit more in-depth analysis around the reasons people paid for things or what prevented them from paying, what would be motivating for them to pay in the future in the statewide report, if that's something that you're curious about. We also wondered who's engaging in these online offerings. And what we learned was that these online offerings actually connected with, engaged many Massachusetts residents who hadn't attended similar programs from organizations in person in the last several years. And we really nested that within different parts of the arts and culture sector. We're gonna have this slide on performing arts and then we'll have one that comes um, in just a minute on more visual arts, museums and outdoors. Um, but if we could go back to the performing arts one for a second, what each of these bars is representing is that, that green proportion here. So for world music, of the total population of people who engaged online through a world music organization sometime in the last year, over three quarters, 77%, hadn't been through the doors, hadn't been in person to any world music concert or event. Um, and that's a pretty hefty proportion of people who are engaging. Um, so it's clear that arts and culture organizations aren't just kind of reaching the usual suspects, but shifting them to an online format that we're really broadening out who is reached here. Now, this data is provided at a state level. Um, it gets, because, because of the complexity of all these different genres and how it's answered, there's not enough of a sample size at the regional level to look at it. But even on the lower end here, to have even a fifth of people who are engaging online not have been through the doors of that organization any organization of that type recently feels pretty profound. And so we can take a look at museums and outdoor activities. The spread is a little bit less wide here with a high of 60% for architectural tour or design museums, um, down to a little bit lower for some of those outdoor or child-friendly activities. Um, we don't have a slide on this, but I just want to mention to you that this is something we talk about again in the in the broader state report that we also looked to see whether or not those who were engaging online but hadn't been through the doors in person were more diverse demographically than those who were doing both things, who had, were online but had also been in person. And we found that there is also kind of a diversification in terms of race and ethnicity, education and income level that's happening among those online only engagers who hadn't been through the doors of arts and culture organizations previously. So we were interested in exploring what it is about these online experiences that's most compelling for people. And we are thinking about this at a number at three different levels. So you'll see this kind of progression of three slides here that will focus on this question about the importance of qualities of online arts and culture opportunities. And this first one really focuses on the, the ways that online arts and culture activities can let people experience organizations and artists from other locations that they normally wouldn't see in person. And that's huge, very high level of agreement that this is really important. It's part of why people find value in online arts and culture activities at the state level and even more so for South Coast and South Shore. That's a big compelling reason to engage online. For the next slide, we explored the importance of this same kind of theme, but around content that came from local organizations. Is it important that online lets you connect to local organizations? And there's still a fairly sizable group who says that this is important to them, but it is a much smaller group than that. Um, proportion who's talking about wanting to connect outside of their local area. Um, so 42% for the state and 44% for South Coast and South Shore. And then the third level is really about connecting with organizations that they've actually have a relationship with, that they've attended previously or that they're following, that they feel connected to. And that's at around the same level as that kind of local organization question. And there's probably a lot of you know, overlap between those two groups, the organizations that are local and the ones with whom people already have attended or have a relationship with. So while we tend to focus most of our survey questions on people's current and past behaviors, preferences, attitudes, hopes, um, we do every once in a while ask them to predict into the future. And we felt that this was important. We heard from partners that this was really important to understand with respect to online arts and culture activities. 
And what we learned here is that there really is a desire for in-person arts and culture activities once they become more available. Keeping in mind that this data was collected in May of 2021, so this could be a really different picture now. Um, but we did see that over two thirds of people across the state said that they'd prefer in person and almost three quarters, 73% in South Coast and South Shore said that they would usually or always prefer in person content over online. But there still is a fairly, you know, hardy group here who's agnostic, who will make decisions based on content um, or who has kind of equal preference across those two modes of connection. Um, great. Thanks, Jen. So talking next about cultural justice, so the perceptions of systemic racism, um, social issues that can be addressed, um, and what Massachusetts residents value most out of arts and culture organizations, first off, is just being welcoming for all kinds of people and being accessible. Um, here, what we are comparing in the dark gray is the state of Massachusetts versus where the nation uh, landed as a whole. And you can see that across the board, um, Massachusetts residents are find a lot of these qualities much more um, much more important than the nation as a whole. Being welcoming, being widely accessible, being of high quality, um, offering a broad diversity of voices as well. Um, then, when we look for how people would want change for arts and culture organizations, um, we see that access and new works uh, is number one. So just being less formal, having more affordable ticket prices, but in a very close second is equity and inclusion uh, and belonging and welcome. Um, so having more diverse voices, uh, just being friendlier to more kinds of people. Um, and then finally with, with almost 50% of people um, also wanted to see a greater level of community rootedness. So just working with others in the community, supporting local artists and organizers, um, reflecting stories that they're hearing uh, in their communities as well. And we asked as well about a number of social issues that Massachusetts residents, as well as South Coast and South Shore would want to be addressed by arts and cultural organizations. Uh, and we found that nearly everybody, so 80% of South Coast and South Shore residents said that there was at least one social issue that they would like uh, arts and cultural organizations to address. So we're gonna take a, a quick pause um, to ask you guys a question and see what social issues have you have been addressed through your organizations or art artistic practices, or if you're not involved with an organization, what have you seen organizations around addressing um, over these last couple of years? Um, so to give you some of the response options, and you can put these in the chat, um, that we offered respondents was the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, climate change and natural disasters, food insecurity, income inequality and the wealth gap, uh, the opioid and heroin epidemic, political division in the US, uh, systemic racial injustices, um, or, or anything else as well. We'll give it a minute. It's great to see these coming in. Thank you for, thank you for participating with us. We're eager to see you know, what's happening in the arts and culture landscape in New Bedford, sorry, <laughs> in New Bedford, but also in South Shore and South Coast more widely. Yeah, and Margo says they've been helping with uh, recovery from the pandemic as well as addressing systemic racism. Um, I'm seeing a few for climate change as well as good health and well being. I saw one earlier about um, experiences of new and undocumented immigrants. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, so to show you what, what the oh, audience is. What's that? Just noting that there's a couple. Um, addressing mental health as well. Mental health, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. So what was top among the state was systemic racial injustice, income inequality, and climate change. And those three were also among the highest for South Coast and South Shore residents, although climate change and natural disasters um, and systemic racism were, were kind of tied at the top with almost, almost half of respondents um, wanting wanting arts and culture organizations to address these issues. Um, income inequality is also up there, food insecurity and hunger, um, and then about a quarter of people uh, talking about political division in the US. It seems like there's a lot of parallels between climate change. We didn't ask specifically about mental health, 
mm -hmm. um, that would have been good to include, but we did have an other option and that did come up quite frequently there. But it seems like, anyway, there's a lot of alignment between the issues that you're saying um, your organizations, your personal practice address and what matters to your community, which is great to see. Yeah. So looking in the systemic racism, we, we asked people um, what their perceptions were of systemic racism in specific arts and cultural organization types. Um, so as you see here, the again, the dark bar is Massachusetts, the light gray is the nation as a whole. Massachusetts residents overall were more likely to find that, um, or to believe that systemic racism is present in almost all of arts and culture organizations that we presented from history museums and art museums at the top end um, to libraries and zoos and aquariums at the bottom. We also found that within the state, Black and African Americans were significantly more likely to, to say that, uh, to have perceptions of systemic racism across the board. Um, and here you see too that, that theater groups, um, especially are, are quite higher than um, where the state and the nation were um, generally. But still history museums, art museums, operas, orchestras, um, at the top end of those, parks, botanic gardens, at the lower end, but still, about a third um, of African Americans. Now, I will say there were other um, racial and ethnic groups in the state that did also have higher ratings. Um, Asian and Pacific Islanders, Hispanic and Latinx were often higher than the rest of the state, but we didn't see it as consistently across the board as we did with African Americans. And then in the South Coast and South Shore specifically, we saw a couple of differences. Um, one, you can kind of see that Generally, a lot of these are lower than where the state is as a whole, um, except for a few key areas. One, history museums is right about on par um, with what the rest of the state thinks, but festivals and fairs are higher as well as world and folk music organizations um, as, as being perceived to have systemic racism present in those types of organizations. Great. So we've just taking you through a whirlwind of data points across lots of different topic areas and themes. Uh, we welcome questions, reflections on what you saw, what resonated, what was surprising. We, we really enjoy you know, having that kind of conversation, so um, we welcome it. But I just want to reflect on the fact that the impact of this kind of cultural research really is around these conversations that it sparks, the fact that it can help shift priorities, or support movement and action that's underway and inspire experiments in cultural practice, philanthropy and policy. And you know, so we need all of you in order to take this and, and create action from it. And we're eager to support that kind of activation and action making and meaning making as we go. We'll reflect on some of the Kind of themes that emerge in terms of potential action areas here. Um, these are, it's not a full list, it's really just the ones that come to the very top of the, the list in terms of seeing themes across multiple questions and seeing really strong evidence in support of this kind of action from the community. So the first one here is around becoming an anti-racist organization and combating systemic racism. And thinking about this, there's a lot of layers to this work. Um, we all know that this kind of work is, is often an ongoing process within many organizations. I think that those internal transformations toward anti-racism work um, are one level. There's also a programmatic focus that many organizations think about for this kind of work. And then connections that you can make to other organizations in the community that are, that are doing this work. How can you support, um, partner with them are all levels that we think about here. Uh, there's real evidence, especially in South Coast and South Shore, of a desire for deeper community participation and co-creation and collaboration around programming. I think that can happen at the individual level, at the organizational level. Um, but as many of you who have these kinds of partnerships know, they are time intensive and that they move really at the speed of trust. Uh, it's not something that can be forced, but a process um, and kind of a growth over time. The third one here is really about supporting all people and feeling actively welcome. Matt mentioned the, the fact that wanting welcoming spaces was one of the top kind of values that people saw reflected, want to see reflected in arts and culture organizations. 
Um, and we wanted to lift that up. I think it can be easy when we feel comfortable in a space and we've been coming there every day for years um, to kind of not see all the components of the structures of welcome um, and the, the ways that a new person who hasn't been to your organization or program or event before might experience it. And so we encourage you to be talking to those people, um, exploring the extent to which people are feeling actively welcomed and how you could potentially ramp that up even further in your spaces. The digital frontier is an interesting one. The new audience that it brings, we found some promising findings here around how digital can broaden and diversify audiences, but some less than gwine statistics related to revenue generation and sustainability. Um, so this one is a little bit more vague. It's more about let's think about this, let's grapple with it and talk about what this could look like going forward and if there's, you know, what the new future of digital engagement is. Uh, and then the last one here, finding your role in social change. Many of you are doing this already in ways that are really aligned with the kind of issues that your community cares about. Again, I think we can think about those different levels. This is happening internally, programmatically, externally. Given the social issues that matter to your community, you know, how do those issues align with your mission? Are there updates potentially that we might want to make to mission so that the, these things are more reflected there? I think there's a lot of possibilities for discussion. Uh, and luckily, we have some examples here um, that we can draw on. So we're going to pause for any questions that people have. Um, and I haven't Jen, been monitoring the chat. So Jen, Laura had a question about um, how the survey was disseminated and who was surveyed, um, which I can help address. Um, and also how people who don't use technology like email were included in the survey process. Um, so Laura, the way that we sent this out first off was to we contacted organizations um, generally across the country, but then in Massachusetts specifically, we worked um, with advisors like Margo um, and the Barr Foundation to identify organizations within Massachusetts to send out um, the survey to their audience lists, um, audience list, participants list, however they defined audiences. Um, you could just be somebody who, who comes in and, and gives an email address. But so that was kind of the, the audience side of it. The other thing we did as well was we went with a, um, a panel provider. So someone who they send out surveys to um, people who sign up and it was through an organization called NORC, which is one of the kind of top panel providers in the country. They have this panel called Amerispeak that truly represents the, um, the nation as a whole, the state as a whole for Massachusetts. Um, and so using their respondents. So we collected responses from them within the state of Massachusetts that represented the, the various demographics around the state, um, things around race and ethnicity, around age, around income level, um, and then use that to kind of um, guide and shape how we viewed the other responses as well that we collected through the audience lists. Jen, did you want to say any more about that? I don't know if there's any other questions you have specifically, Laura, but um, I think knowing that we combined these two data sets, the panel that Matt's talking about and the open invite that went out through the lists, but we did that in a very systematic way to make sure that the combined sample was actually reflective of the Massachusetts state population as a whole. So it's not kind of unduly um, including all these responses from arts and culture organization lists that that's been kind of um, quieted and other voices have been amplified so that the whole is reflective of the population of the state. Are there any other questions at this time? And if not to, you know, feel free to put them in the chat as we continue and, and Jen and I can also um, just address them later on or we can always send out emails too. Well, let's keep moving because we've got a lot of ground to cover, but like Matt said, pop those into the chat whenever um, they occur to you. Um, or feel free to email us, we'll pop our emails into there as well. Um, and we're going to shift over to sharing community perspectives on some of these action areas. And Margo's going to get us started with this first set of uh, discussion points. Great, thank you so much, Jen. And can you hear me okay? All right, awesome. So I'm going to launch right in because I've got a lot of say in a little bit amount of time. Uh, so I do want to thank Silver Linnet and the Bar Foundation for letting me present today and inviting me to present. 
Uh, New Bedford Creative is housed at the New Bedford Economic Development Council, which is a separate nonprofit from the city. And our primary scope is to implement the city's arts and culture plan, which was published in December 2018. And on the screen here is the overall vision of the plan. It's an approximate 10 year plan and we just began our fourth year implementing it. In relation to the culture and community um, report, New Bedford Creative and the EDC participated in wave two of this national research study along with six other New Bedford organizations. So um, much of the the data uh, that that the data group is coming from some of these organizations. And Matt, you can go to the next slide, please. So our data uh, supports these five action areas, and I'd like to briefly review how we've been implementing them. The first is our grant program called Wicked Cool Places, which we launched in 2019. And we originally positioned this grant as a placemaking grant program and described it as a collaborative grant program that would quote, help transform New Bedford's overlooked or undervalued places, end quote. So this description was incredibly insulting if you are a resident of New Bedford, and especially if you're a resident who had been and has been contributing to your neighborhood and community for years. So this came to light in a major way in uh, 2021 when we did a series of conversations with BIPOC artists, and we received a grant from the New England Foundation for the Arts called Collective Imagination for Spatial Justice. So, um, and I do want to give a shout out because one of the very talented young women who led these conversations is on this webinar right now, Jasmine Baird, who is the Senior Creative Fellow for New Bedford Creative. And she was joined by Laurel Berryman, who at the time was a racial justice facilitator for the YWCA. So through these conversations, we made several adjustments to our process to make it more equitable. So we made changes to the application itself. We altered the rubric of scorings to boost first time grant writers, individual artists and community organizers. And this past year, we changed the context of the grant to be placemaking or place keeping. And we describe it as a grant program for making or keeping a place where things are happening and people want to be that involve and impact residents of New Bedford. So this year, about a month ago, we announced 16 projects that I believe will make arts and culture experiences more welcoming, address social issues, foster community collaborations, and begin to dismantle systemic racism. You can go to the next slide, please, Matt. So now we have our Art is Everywhere grant. This grant program is funded by Mass Development's TDI Creative Cities Initiative. New Bedford was a pilot for this program. And this year, Mass Development is launching in three other cities with a grant from the Bar Foundation. We launched Art is Everywhere in early 2020, right before the pandemic. And the first grant recipient was Third Eye Youth Empowerment. And you will hear more about Third Eye from Peter Linnell Walker, who I believe is one of our upcoming presenters. So I wanna skip ahead to 2021, our second round of grants to address the negative, actually you can go back, I'm still on Art is Everywhere, thanks Matt. <laughs> Um, to address the negative impacts of the pandemic, we changed the focus for Art is Everywhere to support inspiring creative ideas that will directly impact a current challenge facing the residents of New Bedford. And we specifically said that in all cases, projects that focused on diversity, equity, inclusion, and access would be prioritized. So what you see here, this is the one of the six projects we funded. This is called South Coast Learning Trails, and it's a project by the New Bedford Birth to Grade 3 Partnership and the South Coast Early Childhood Coalition. So this project was coordinated by a lead artist, and she is on here today, Tracy Silva Barbosa in the bottom right photo. 
and Tracy worked with the core team and matched five artists with five businesses in the north end of New Bedford. This is a neighborhood with a high population of immigrants. And over the course of a year, each artist is changing out their temporary murals to feature one of the five elements of the basics. The basics is a national movement to support early childhood learning and brain development. And I just found out this week that one of the organizers of this project presented this, uh, this project at a national convention around the basics. So um, moving on, one of the goals of this grant is to encourage cross-sector collaboration, which will foster deeper community collaboration. And we will be announcing our next round, March 21st of this month. So we are looking forward to um, receiving even more um, applications in this, in this program. Matt, you can go to the next slide, please. And finally, New Bedford has been selected for a place-based pilot this year called Creating Connection, which is a research and messaging initiative created by Arts Midwest and Metropolitan Group that helps creative organizations connect their messages and programs to existing community values. It's a national initiative to make creative expression a recognized, valued, and expected part of everyday life. So last month, uh, we launched this this training program with eight organizations in New Bedford, their Third Eye Youth Empowerment by Black New Bedford, Cape Verdean Association, the New Bedford Historical Society, DATMA, New Bedford Symphony Orchestra, the Co-Creative Center, and New Bedford Art Museum. And we are excited to see how these organizations utilize this initiative to expand their own audience deepen those relationships with the community, as well as contribute to a community-wide messaging campaign to be re released later this year. And we see it as a real opportunity to address all of the recommended action items in this report. And I will conclude that, um, you know, New Bedford Creative is definitely realizing that our role in, in uh, social change is to um, it intentionally dismantle systemic racism. So of the five action areas, that is our top priority. And I thank you very much for allowing me to present. That concludes my presentation. Back to you, Jen. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Margo. I really appreciate the perspectives and the way that you drew such clear connections between the work that you have underway and your priorities and what we heard from community speakers. So we're going to turn it over to Peter Linnell to talk about Third Eye Youth Empowerment next. Hello, and thank you for having me. Um, while you're taking in this first uh, slide, I would like to pose a, a rhetorical question to the group. And uh, this isn't casting judgment on anyone. I just want you to really think about it. When we're having these conversations about how we connect with our communities and how we engage our communities, ask yourself outside of the people that you work with or the people that you assign to do so, when is the last time you've had a human, inter human to human interaction with someone from a marginalized community? Because I believe that that's one of the most imperative parts and aspects of this conversation is people that are in the position must understand that we must meet people where they are. As you can see through our mission statement, we talk in uh, action, meaning what we're doing, uh, not what we're hoping to do. Um, and we try to continue and strive and uh, carry that process on through the work that we commit to every year. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna take you through um, our action items in our mission statement, but also I'm gonna present how those tie into our formula. So here at Third Eye, we're, um, an edutainment, edutainment apparatus, as we like to call ourselves. Um, and what we do is we focus on the five pillars of hip hop. If you're not familiar with the five pillars of hip hop, it is DJing, I like to say be people, uh, MCing, graffiti, and knowledge as the most important one, right? And in this category of engagement, we think of this as a, who is the person that's responsible for that engagement and a lot of the things that we do and what pillar can represent that or show a good show um, example of how you engage people. That's the MC in my regard, as far as the masters of ceremony. Um, and one of the biggest things in our engagement is the pro person or spokespeople or the people that 
deal with the community must be focused on pure diversity. And when I say pure diversity, I'm not just talking about intersectionality, but you must also be willing to entertain like and unlike minds. Because a lot of the times the difficult, um, the difficult path to those solutions are created in those conversations and that dialogue. Um, but we must maintain a dialogue over a diatribe. And as we've pointed out several times earlier, you must maintain being welcoming to all. Um, there is a natural um, clickiness that happens in organizations sometimes. Uh, just based on who you work well with, don't work well with, but I need everybody to understand in the leadership role that beyond empathetic listening, you also have to have empathetic um, communication as well. Uh, next slide, please. So the DJ, I like to talk about the DJ and a lot of these, and music. Why does music unite people? Uh, it's a social um, construct that has been a part of our human existence since the dawn of time. Um, and music brings life, it brings prosperity, it brings love, it brings care, it uh, communicates and conveys emotional outlets. Um, so we try to unite through our social issues, um, through our mental health, combating apathy, and meeting villages again where they are. It's vitally important that we utilize these uh, different aspects of all of our events that we, whether we're doing it virtually or in person, and be very intentful on how they actually play a role and how people will engage with it. Um, and not just from the perspective of what we think is well-intentioned, it might be a good idea, but based on the feedback that we get from the community when we gather. There should never be an event that we have where we're not actually retaining information from the public on how they feel about it and what they wanna see in their community, much like this uh, survey was about. Uh, next slide, please. So now we're gonna talk about how do you activate? And I love to use a beautiful picture of some of our dancers here from our most deaf dance crew, uh, our B people um, and our visual arts. Uh, I put those two pillars together in this same column. And really activating people is really providing the emotional outlets that they need. Um, but also we have to talk about how do we incentivize young people and people in our community to move in a direction that's towards more positive behavior or positive outcomes. Because so much of our mainstream media, news, you name it, um, seems to show examples of in incentivization for negative behavior, negative results, negative diatribes over positive dialogue. So in Third Eye, we decided to make a shift uh, since I came on 10 years ago to reallocate, look how we, um, how we reallocate our funds and create an incentivized program. And we're happy to say that 50 plus percent of our funding, whether it's from grants or fundraising, goes back into the artist's hands. Um, so whether or not you're painting for a virtual program or in space, uh, we compensate those artists because those artists and those people who are participate, participants in your programming are the true value of your programming. So why should you as an organization receive the funding and the rewards of putting on this programming? But the most important aspect to that is your community members. There should be something that trickles back to those people in those communities uh, because as a young person who came from that background, it's very imperative to understand that once we leave that space, we're immediately thrust back into a world that is not that space. Uh, we're immediately thrust back to worrying about how we're gonna eat, how we're gonna survive, how we're gonna communicate and get through our daily lives. Um, so incentivizing and creating a, a apparatus that will make sure that people are kept whole while leaving our space is important as well. Uh, next slide, please. Then we're going to talk about mentorship, and that's when the knowledge really comes in. Um, this is a wonderful program that we did with uh, Fitz, who also worked on the other project that uh, Margot talked about earlier. Um, he, has, he has a graphic novel series called New Deadford, uh, which is a really cool name. Um, and in his graphic novel, there are a lot of social impact and social issues that we talk about um, in that process. And this was a great workshop that we did with some children over at Blue Meadows. Again, meeting the village where they are. We could ask them to come to our place, but it's more... Um, building that trust when you go into these spaces and deal with people on their level. Um, so, you know, this is the part we talk about the connection and learning. Mentorship is absolutely imperative um, in this process to make sure that we can pass the torch and prepare people to take on the next level. Um, and then practical help and resources. This is how we can provide those practical help and resources in a trustworthy space. Sometimes people will come to your space, whatever that may be, and if they don't feel welcoming at all, the pamphlet or the card or postcard that you hand them doesn't have the same effect as you doing so after you've had a real human-human interaction with them in their community, in their space, and then provide them those resources that they may not be privy to. Um, I think that it's also imperative, too, that we don't, we, if we're talking collaboration, we must 
do a better job at making sure that we, sh if the, we don't provide the resources, we're still sharing resources for other programs throughout this community. We're all under the same umbrella on how we're going to make our community better. Um, and then we have to create a non-judgment zone because for a lot of these people that we're dealing with from these areas are dealing with issues that might not be familiar to you if you come from a life of privilege or if you never had to deal with those things. Again, empathy is the key word here. Um, and you have to create those zones that you can be able to process what the things that different young people, different people in intersectionality, different people period are going through um, and not so much be able to judge, but be again, be able to attach them to the resources if you don't have the ability to address that particular topic. Uh, you don't have to leave that conversation mute. You can literally utilize your ability to tie them in with other organizations in the area um, to create that co-centric system. Um, and then it's about creating safe, equitable spaces. And this is where the communal space comes in. Um, can't stress enough. You can create a welcoming space, that's fine. Or you can create BIPOC-led operated spaces. That's better, um, in my opinion. Um, because one, to me, is enablement. And the other one is empowerment. Um, and we need to do a better job at empowering these people that we interact with in any instance that we have. We can feel like we're empowering, but it can be a form of enablement if we do the work for them. We have to allow people the ability to do the work themselves. Some people are tactile learners, especially in a lot of these marginalized communities. We learn through example. That's This is how hip hop was born. Um, next slide, please. And now this culminates into what our end game is. It's creating transformative leaders. So since Third Eye has been around for 20 plus years now, it has done a stellar job, but we've also gone through a transition. We had to do a lot of reflection. I think it's important that every organization annually takes some reflection and as best as you possibly can, because we are emotionally connected to the work that we do, objectively remove yourself and your personal feelings from the results, from the critiques, from the good and the bad that you'll get from your annual review or reflection of your program and your mission. Um, because if you remove your feelings, we still have to get to the solution based in some root logic. Um, and if we can focus on what is going to be the best possible outcomes of the most possible people, um, we can just move forward knowing that we're doing the best that we possibly can because that's all we really can do. Um, none of us have the magic sauce to just make everything disappear tomorrow, but we have to learn how to manage our own emotional attachment to the projects that we do versus what people feel and their perceptions of what the project actually results in. Um, we cannot uh, downplay enough the, the disconnect between the micro, the micro and the macro level. And we have to have people that are better at bringing people together at the meso level to understand what's going on. So as you can see here, this is this beautiful combination, uh, culmination of the five pillars of hip hop. And we have great examples here of young people in the community that have been going through Third Eye since a lifelong process and now have developed themselves into transformative leaders from um, a young, wonderful young woman at the top left hand side, Geneva, who is an incredible young woman who runs a woe work, woe hair workshop. Uh, it's literally addressing the fact of people of color, we have different hair, what are natural products that we can use, what are natural remedies that we can use, things of that nature. Again, these are social issues that don't seem, they might not seem large and grandiose to others, but it's a serious issue in communities where you don't have the proper hair care supplies or hygiene products for your life. Um, and then we have Tim Blessed, uh, right next to, um, and, and um, DJ on Haley, right next to Geneva, who also a lifelong third eyes and came through the process. And um, DJ on Haley actually is a teacher over at our sister school. Um, and Tim Bless is actually a incredible artist, a credible father, village member, and now a graphic novel author himself, uh, who just put out his book. And again, because we had a diverse BIPOC led and operated space, he felt more than welcome to come into the communal space and utilize our space to do his book showing and his book signing. Then we have my wife, my lovely wife, and my little, uh, my little lovely child there, Egypt. Um, Samia Walker, who's also a lifelong third eye, and she, through this process, is now the executive director for EFRA, Entrepreneurship All South Coast, that works to provide not just work skills, but funding to small businesses in the area and teach people the necessary skills they need to be able to turn whether it's arts or another interest into a commodity, um, into sustainable living. Because we can work in this nonprofit sector, but when we're talking about equity, inclusion, and diversity, we also need spaces for BIPOC people to be able to build in a profitable space. And how can we utilize programs like Third Eye and all of our programs to empower people to get into their profitable space? Because at the end of the day, we still live in this country where people have to pay their bills. Um, and then, you know, one of, so I like to always leave with some, some positives and some things to think about. Like I stressed earlier, I cannot stress enough that we need to have 
creating diverse spaces that are BIPOC led and op operated, we also um, can do a better job at intentionally looking to replace existing leadership with more diverse roles. Um, I think that after what we've seen, if everybody's having all of these diversity and inclusion <laughs> seminars and workshops, if you're not building something into your bylaws, into your system to actually make sure that you're providing diverse roles. And again, I don't, I don't say this to say make uh, instant gratification decisions. This is a postponed gratification process um, to find people and, and cultivate people to be able to be prepared to be in those positions. Um, but it will require some patience um, and we can do that. Um, and then providing constant development and resources. Um, this is a never ending job. Learning is a never ending job. Um, evolving is a never ending job. So, you know, some of us get so um, steeped in what we know um, that sometimes it can create a barrier of actually attentively listening or understanding others if your perspective doesn't see it through their lens. Um, and I ask you um, wholeheartedly to try to put on the glasses that they're looking through. Um, and try to take in some of the world that they live through. And again, that's why I started this with, please try to find some time um, to question yourself about who you talk to, when's the last time you engage with someone in a marginalized community and how you can do so immediately. Uh, Cause the sooner the better. When, when we're talking about trust, the biggest aspect of trust is communication and communicating through email, communicating through virtual, through communicating through program is one side of that, but communicating on a human level is an entirely different level of trust and loyalty that you can gain through your community. And I finished this to say that I hope that, um, you know, you've learned something through this process. I hope that, you know, we've all looked at the stats and we understand that there's plenty of work to do and there always will be some form of work to do in our society. Um, but I wanna say that strategically planning the process to develop transformative leaders is important. Um, and then we really just need to make sure that we focus on having diversity, a quality assurance, I like to call it now. Because sure, we're having these workshops, but who's maintaining the quality of assurance in our boards and in our infrastructure? So I think that, and we're talking about it at Third Eye, we might be the case study for this, of creating a quality, a diversity and inclusion quality assurance officer on our board to ensure and keep people intact with making sure that we're getting the metrics that we need, that people are getting the training that they need, that they have the open door policy to be heard empathetically, and that making sure that those same people are being trained up in a way where they can roll into a bigger leadership role and possibly take over the helm of the uh, position. But this is not gonna be exclusive just to people of color as well. We want uh, white folks to be involved in these roles to again, learn better. When we talk about the communal space, again, it's, it's indicative on the community to come together and have these hard, nuanced conversations about the different things that are going on because we can try to create these things that gloss over them but we're really not getting anywhere if we don't learn how to converse and have a dialogue through these issues and that's what we try to do here at third eye in the communal space and we want to thank you know um new bedford creative everybody bar foundation everybody who supports uh, if you're a villager on here right now and you've been involved with us in any way we're thankful for everybody and every experience that we have um and i appreciate you thank you Thanks so much, Peter. I appreciate the the way that you have this 10 year history with the organization and can speak to some of the transformative nature and the development of leaders. It's it's really moving. Um, OK, so we have one more community perspective to share. Brittany Ann Harvey will be talking to us next from Fall River Museum of Contemporary Art. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for having me here. Thank you, Peter, for this, this work. Um, so our organization, the Fall River Museum of Contemporary Art, is a budding organization. So we're, we're pretty brand new. We started in October of 2020, uh, and we're housed in uh, 502 Bedford Street. So you can see the images here. Um, we're on the ground floor. It's the Merrow Manufacturing Building. Um, so it is an active textile mill above us. And um, we have the ground floor space, and it was renovated. Um, as you can see here to kind of transform it from this more working class um, zone to a bit of an exhibition space, um, a little bit more um, traditionally known um, for art. But we are, you know, very excited that we're housed within um, this more working class space um, of, of an active textile mill. We think that's something unique to Fall River and to um, the region. So um, we definitely, you know, have called upon that in our in our previous programming, and and definitely um, plan to highlight that connection um, further in, in some of our programming. 
Um, but the origin of FR Mocha really, you know, was imperative um, with community support and community engagement. We wouldn't exist without that. Um, we initially this 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 museum um, budded out of an invitation of myself and um, my husband and co-founder Harry Harvey um, to curate a two-day exhibition as a part of um, the Fabric Arts Festival um, that um, um, Portugalia and Michael Benavides uh, kind of created uh, about three years ago, I think. Um, so, you know, we we had that initial kind of um, you know introduction into into doing something in Fall River. We, my husband and I myself are both from the city um, for the most part, the south coast of Mass, and we've done certain curatorial projects um, around this region um, and have been active in the arts community for the past 10 years or so. But um, in terms of doing something a little bit more formal in Fall River, um, Michael Benavides and the Fabric Arts Festival really kind of gave us that platform um, so, you know, it was supposed to be a two-day exhibition, um, and just because of, you know, the support we got from them, um, from Marrow Manufacturing in terms of using this space and the immense, like, community turnout from the opening, um, we really realized how important of a space this was to try to maintain for Fall River. So our whole approach really with the opening was to kind of, and even the naming of it was to see it as a permanent mainstay um, for the city of Fall River because it's something that we've always wanted to see here ourselves. You know, we've always had to um, travel outside of the region to gain access to um, um, more contemporary art and um, be a part of this kind of global art conversation. So we, we really wanted to be able to kind of bring that here um, to a more working class community um, and create a resource for the community here that is so deserving of it, even though, you know, a, a lot of um, the economic situation here doesn't always allow for, for families to kind of gain access to those types of things. So we are completely, um, completely free, open to the public. It was very important to us that we maintain, um, you know, being a free institution um, so that it can, you know, really have as much access as possible. And that wasn't a barrier. Um, to those um, that were wishing to view art. Um, and also in terms of our curatorial projects, um, you know, we really, we really kind of have shifted our focus toward um, ensuring that there is something grounding um, our exhibitions in Fall River. Um, so our current, um, our current show has a collaboration with the Maritime Museum here in Fall River. Um, and in our front exhibition space, which you can kind of see through the, the doorway there in that image, there's a bit of a foyer there. And we have um, some, some items on loan from the Maritime Museum um, all around the Fall River line, um, which was a, a ferry that um, uh, went from Ma Manhattan to Fall River for about a hundred years between um, the mid 1800s and the 1900s. Um, and a lot of you know, folks in the community here have family members that worked on those ships. Um, some of them still have ephemera and, and whatnot um, in their attics uh, or basements. And you know, it's very much a part of the working history of Fall River um, and, and the industry that has you know, developed um, and transitioned over time here. So, we wanted to kind of root um, our, the rest of our exhibition in that um, more direct history of Fall River um, and speak to the different kind of working classes um, um, on that ship as a kind of um, preface to the uh, other conversations that we are having in the exhibition. So um, yeah, so we, we, have a, we have a docent, uh, we're open on the weekends, 12 to five, Saturdays and Sunday, and we have a docent that um, kind of gives this more uh, in-depth tour around the work and trying just to make uh, viewing art a little bit more conversational. Um, you know, we're really aware of the kind of, um, you know, the kind of, I don't know if it's hierarchy or 
you know, the inaccessibility that contemporary art can sometimes uh, feel, especially in these more like white cube um, spaces that can be a little bit alienating. So um, we try to make that as conversational as possible um, and really just start to focus more so on our outreach and direct engagement within the community. Um, so you can go to the next slide and I'll speak a little bit to that. So um, FR MOCA has really kind of collaborated with um, many different educational institutions in the area. Um, our, our main focus, I would say, is the Fall River Public Schools because we really want um, FR MOCA to be an ongoing resource for, for the kids in the, in the city and have you know, the accessibility basically be a part of their arts programming um, with the school. We really, we don't want there to feel like there's much separation there, but we are here for them to, to view art, to talk about art, um, to utilize myself and um, all of our employees as resources to, you know, help navigate their intention for their art or whatever it is, um, because so much um, happens just through these conversations and, and understanding, you know, where people are trying to go and um, what they're trying to figure out. And because, you know, artists have their own vision, they have their own um, trajectory that is self-guided. And so we're just, we're there to kind of help that progress along. Um, and on the right-hand side, one of the, uh, the image there is um, myself and a couple um, of the AP art students at Fall River um, Durfee High School. One of them just reached out to me uh, just the other day about, wanting to self-publish a book um, that she's been working on since the eighth grade. Um, and so she's not sure how to go about that. And so, you know, I think we're gonna meet this weekend and just kind of talk through what the reality of something like that is, right? And, and what are the resources that you need to try to um, access to do that? And um, yeah, so it's just those kinds of really individual conversations that are so important. And I think really connect um, in a meaningful way um, kind of Peter Licker, you're talking about, you know, having that human to human um, interaction, because um, that's, you know, that's what I've gotten so much out of in my, in my life, in my art career. And um, so we really just want to do that for others as well. Um, and so, you know, we've also engaged with UMass Dartmouth, uh, Roger Williams University. Um, we're giving tours to um, RISD students um talking with BU so there's a lot of that kind of connection with these other institutions and just trying to have a wider spread um you know network um of what the museum can really kind of be a part of in terms of these other conversations um and in terms of UMass Dartmouth we are working with um Gabo Chemnitzer in this upcoming semester to uh, um and invite, I guess you could say, his social practice class um, into our space and kind of in a metaphorical way, give, give them the keys to the museum. So um, they've kind of started the semester looking at different social, social issues and, and, and learning, you know, how can, how can an artist kind of take action um, on such things? And so for the second half of the semester, we're gonna have them in our space and just continue those conversations and have it culminate in a bit of a, a bit of a exhibition, open studio workshop, you know, kind of whatever takes form um, where they'll be able to have the platform of this little, you know, more kind of institutional space, but to, you know, communicate to the community, you know, these issues that, that, they're, that they're thinking about and, and, and wanting to see change in, so. Um, that's really been our, our focus this year and moving forward is having these fundamental connections with the youth in the area. Um, and we hope to just continue to spread that as much as possible um, and, and continue to be the resource that we've become over the short year and a half that, that we've been in existence. So appreciate you all having us here today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brittany. It's great to get also the perspective of a, of a nascent organization who's, you know, extending all these tendrils into the community and these deep connections. So it, I love the range of perspectives that, um, that we've been able to hear from today. So we'd love to 
transition over to more time to reflect together in smaller groups. I know you've been hearing from us as speakers for most of this discussion, and we'd really love to hear from you and reflect with you about your own organization or practice in this area, any barriers um, or supports that could be helpful to you along any of these action areas um, and what you've observed in the arts and culture field along these areas. So uh, Jasmine's gonna help us break out into small groups. Um, we're gonna just do that for like eight minutes to have some conversation and then circle back to the full group um, to share back, out. oh wow. You can see everyone's faces, it's lovely. Um, share back to the, to the full group and reconvene at the end. Um, so if you will stick with us, we would love to hear from you as this kind of next step. Hey, Margo, yes. in our breakout, it was mentioned that you have New Bedford specific data um, in relation to kind of some of the data points that were presented. Would you be, um, would you be able to share that with the rest of the group? Yep. Thank you. The, the one thing, and I will make a note of it, the one thing is that the New Bedford data is not weighted like the other, the other data was. So I'll make sure to let everyone know that. I think I learned that that was not enough time. We were like just getting yeah. into good conversation. So I already have a really, really good learning from this. Um, I'm well, curious if others felt the themselves. same thing. People were able to introduce themselves and then we were gone. <laughs> I know. I know. So I think an hour and a half too. It's, it's tough to balance. It's so hard for people to get a big chunk of the day um, set aside for something like this, but definitely need a little more time for those small group discussions. Um, I mean, if, if you were doing this again, I would suggest that you give people the option of coming back like tomorrow at lunchtime, mm. um, because I think two hours is really hard for people to segment in one. Also, it's hard to sit. Um, but I mean, if you sort of said, okay, and so now we've had the session and we invite you to come back tomorrow or next Wednesday or whenever and have lunch with us and just kind of talk about it as a brown bag lunch session. I love that idea. I think that yeah. could be really interesting to, to try out and to pull in. Um, great. And we and uh, would love to have lunch together. Yeah. Matt, would you mind, we're going to paste a link to a survey actually into the chat that we would love to have you take so we can get your any insights that you have about the mix of things that we talked about, how we used our time, what we could ramp up um, or change. We'd really appreciate your insights there. Thanks, Matt. Um, and it's like five questions. We've made it as quick as we possibly can, <laughs> um, too. So uh, I'm going to make a plug for that. Given in the couple of minutes that we have left, um, I'd love to still open it up for any reflections from those small groups that we want to share out or any questions that emerged. Um, I think, Margo, I heard you talking about one to bring up potentially. The question that came up in one of the breakout rooms is we did receive the raw data from, so from you, thank you very much, Matt and Jen, um, for the New Bedford organization. So anyone in New Bedford who wants to see the report from that raw data, I'm happy to send that report out. Um, and the, the important thing to note is that it's not weighted like the, the uh, reports, reporting information that was in this presentation and that's in the report. I'll jump in and share that. While we had just started to kind of scratch the surface in our group, um, Peter brought up the role of arts and culture organizations in around gentrification and messaging and how to keep the community whole. I don't know if you want to speak to that for a minute, Peter, but that was a theme that um, really resonated with our group. Um, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, a lot of people here have already talked to me about this. Um, and if you haven't, um, it's a concern of mine. I originally moved to New Bedford 10 years ago. Um, and I went through a life of transformation, but I grew up in the inner city projects of Boston, uh, one of the inner city project housing complexes in Boston. And um, I would respectfully, New Bedford in the South Shore is about 20 years behind the gentrification process that I witnessed in that city. Um, but it's been hyper accelerated recently. Um, and we can no longer deny it. 10 years ago, when I moved here, you can get a quality three bedroom apartment at six, 700 bucks, and you can sustain as a working family. 
right now we're we're living we're moving into an inha uh, uninhabitable space for a lot of people in marginalized communities so when we're talking about people engaging um, and getting involved with what we're doing and we're talking about messaging i think particularly to our area especially on the south coast we're dealing with a massive migration that is taking place from people you know i, I came here as a gentrification refugee um as i like to call it um because they were it, it i couldn't sustain living in boston but now we're creating a situation. And again, I like to talk about the natural byproduct because there's, a, there's a, a part of gentrification that just comes with living in America, which is if you have disposable income and a place creates opportunities, people tend to gravitate. But the part that people are missing is most people that have that income are white folks. So how are we as organizations in arts and culture community, how can we use our platforms to provide equitable messaging and campaigns that talk about how we keep our residents whole and how do we get them actively engaged in the new booming industry coming to our city such as offshore wind because it's vitally imperative that they have the industry outside of the service industry that is just a revolving door for a lot of people in their 20 somethings um and how can i look my child in the face and say you can live grow stay in new bedford if there's not a viable pat we are good all of us here are privileged OK, but there's a whole swath of people that aren't and don't have a pathway, clear pathway to industry to be able to sustain the change in economics that's coming to our city very fast. When that train opens, I think that apathy has creeped into our community and a lot of everybody, a lot of people. But we, we we can't buy into it because our community will change in a way that it will never be the same or a resemblance of what New Bedford has been and what we appreciate. Um, so I, I say that to say that, you know, we as arts and culture, everybody's doing marketing and branding that should be solely leaned on by our arts and culture community shouldn't be one company you bring in that's a third party to outsource that they can be there and be a part of the conversation, but it should be all of our concentric circles working together as a conglomerate to talk about these issues because the more that we don't and we can't personalize it don't personalize it it's not you it's a system we're all products of the system whether it's system systemic racism you name it we're all products of that system in some way subconsciously and consciously we just have to embrace it and be focused on the solution so i talk about the plan the pain the plan and then the progress we can all relate to the pain we have to formulate the plan, but that plan has to be steeped in progress. Um, and if it's not steeped in progress and it's steeped in procrastination or just rhetoric for filling and checking boxes, we're gonna suffer a massive migration and a massive amount of violence in our city. We all know food costs have gone up, inflation has gone up, it's wild right now. Um, and I can tell you crimes and necessity are up everywhere. Um, and I say crimes and necessity because everybody doesn't want to be a criminal some people have to feed their families so how do we how can we do a better job as an arts community to convey these messages that are latent in our society especially in south shore thanks so much peter um so we've come to the end of our time together we really appreciate you sticking with us being part of these conversations we're going to compile the notes um, from those sessions such as they are uh, and we appreciate you kind of being the first set of people that we do this with um, we're learning as we go. We appreciate any feedback that you have about how we can continue to improve this work. Any last words from our organizers? Thank you so much, Jen, Matt, Sue Ellen. Thank you all for joining us today and stay tuned. There's more to come. Cool. Thanks all. <laughs>